Hello, everyone. It's Annie Lennox here having a conversation. I'm going to have a conversation in one second with someone that I have the deepest respect for. Um, there's a there's a world there's a word a word called hero, and um, for me there are more sheroes. <laughs> it's, it's, sounds bizarre but i actually this is, truly have a very small group of shiros that um are, i complete i walk with in life and zainab zalvi is absolutely one of them and um, zainab gives me inspiration every day because i go to her instagram page and zainab posts very personal messaging and she's been posting recently from her lockdown situation she's i think i'm assuming that she has been alone but she will tell us in a moment um how can i even begin to describe her she's one of the most um extraordinary human rights activists and uh mostly for women she's gone to the darkest places in the world and come back and created an organization for example women for women which is simply extraordinary and now she is well what can i say an author um she has had and has probably i'm going to ask her her own television shows um she uh connects with the world in in an incredible way and so now I'm, i will introduce zena Zalbi, please. <laughs> Good morning. Good Thank afternoon. You, Annie. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have to say, I start my day every day with my meditation, and in it, I start saying, I dedicate myself to awareness, to the path of awareness with those who are seeking awareness, my family and friends. We are suffering and awakening together. And, you know, you are in that um, community i would say people who are seeking awareness dedicated to awareness um and suffering and awakening together and so it's a, a privilege to be in this conversation with you annie thank you so so much for this kind introduction and for you for your own postings and for your own um voice and i don't mean voice as people know your voice you know mm -hmm. in the music but it's voice is the voice of your heart of your own message of what you actually conveying and saying in the world and for that i'm truly truly grateful my sister in awareness in seeking the awareness that's so beautiful you know it seems for me that words are insufficient um words are incredible actually you know as a as a as a singer i've used words they have been the material of the way to convey something uh, as well as the melodies and the the music that accompanies that and um you know we're using words now to communicate with each other but they do <laughs> they do seem insufficient i am so excited to talk to you uh because your significance for me uh, is really um something that helps my daily life because it, i find it very hard to find true inspiration in other human beings, to be honest with you. I look into books and um, sometimes I draw something from passages, you know, I mean, obviously you say every morning you wake up and you meditate. And I've noticed that about your posts. That's been very interesting for me because um, I would like to ask you about your journey i wonder if that's always been a practice for you or if it has come in over the more recent years that's a good question you know i have always been inclined to um connect with spirituality and spirit and all of that but i'm a known as a feminist activist women's right activist all of that so for the longest time i was actually really shy and hid this away from the world and like not even my colleagues knew that about me i had like a group of friends that i would just go and meditate together but it's a secret because i was too um 
didn't want people to change my feminist uh, <laughs> persona kind of thing. And then over time, um, that space between me and my heart became actually the only way I could process things in the world. I, you know, as you said before, I was working with women survivors of wars in the darkest, darkest of places and witnessed and seen and met and women who have gone through horrible things. And I could, I, and I realized that if I share that with others, sometimes they would be overwhelmed and says, oh, don't tell us. So I actually figured out the space between me and my space, myself. I create a corner. Wherever I live, I create a corner for myself um, that becomes my corner, my, my touchstone. And that's when I started, uh, that's where I cry, that's where I laugh, that's where I meditate, that's what I do. Everything is in that corner, basically. And over time, I start realizing the difference in me. As a writer, or a speaker, media, feminist, activist, between the days, I start with connecting with my heart and the days I don't connect with my heart mm -hmm. is radically different. Same person, same values, um, same beliefs, but the day I connect with my heart, there's a humility to me. Um, you know, like a, a lot, there's a lot of anger right now in the world, right? They, and, and it's a righteous anger. It is a correct anger. Uh, often, you know, at, at, especially at the racial and economic injustice. And as someone who has this anger in me, how I express that anger, the day I start with connecting with my heart, it's uh, more grounded. I am more grounded in myself. As opposed to the day I don't connect with my heart, it becomes my activism, my expression in the world becomes shouting from the broadness of my chest, like, ah, as opposed to centering myself and speaking from the length of my spine. And there are two different energies to them. And so, yes, I started my practice. You know, I think one time you asked me on Instagram if I have what books I read and how I'm learning these things. I mean, I do read the books and I do listen to Eckhart Tolle and Thich Nhat Hanh, all. but honestly a lot of what I share just comes after my meditation I meditate I listen to my heart I you know I, I believe heart has language and wisdom we just don't hear it that often because this is like our mind is speaking all the time and I connect there and then I speak so it's my best teacher but that's my ritual. My ritual became very connected to my activism. It is not separated from my activism. Um, it is how I activate myself in the world it has to start from my heart. And that's um, my daily ritual. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because it's very personal. And it's something that I just picked up because I was trying to think about the first time I ever set eyes on you. And I think it must have been at a Women for Women event um, many years ago, but I'm not sure because my memory is a little, kind of there's so much, so many things went on in my life. It's insane, really. A whole world of activity. But the thing is that I kind of picked up from your Instagram posts that was something else going on. I mean, you know, from what you've said, and how you've expressed yourself. And I've been drawn to it because sometimes I feel quite ravaged by what's going on. I'm, I've realized that I am an empathetic person. There is such a thing with emotional intelligence that's kind of sometimes a bit off the charts. I'm not intelligent in the way of uh, arithmetic and certain kind of calculations, more left brain thinking. That's not my skill. My skill has been something else. And I've come to realize that over the years, you know, when I went to school, it was a long time ago and they had very strict practices. So, you know, if you weren't good at maths and you weren't good at science, but you were actually told that you were stupid, kind of, you were, but the, infer and the inference was that you were stupid. And um, 
I had an inferiority complex. I've looked, I've regard, I've understood that that's where it's come from. But because all my life, I've been a dreamer, you know? And at school, I was kind of told off for that regularly. And I didn't even know that I was doing it. I was gazing out the window like this and not paying attention, not focusing. But that has been where I've gone. So I'm, what I'm saying is I have this kind of empathy, emotional intelligence, thinking that I'm not very bright. And so that's been a difficult, that's been something I had to overcome. And then this kind of dreamy space, which I figured out after a while, oh, I like to express it. I understood when I was about 11 or 12 that I started writing poems and that helped me, you know, that expression. Again, we go back to the words, words, that words are so powerful. And when I could write and put the words down and combine them and it had a feeling, you know, it was something I said, oh, that's, that's strong. Actually, I'm feeling this feeling and I'm putting it down, here it is, boom, I could see the feeling coming back to me. I mean, I'm rambling now, but I'm just, honestly, it's a kind of free flow that I can share with you. I, I gotta tell you, I mean, I'm so glad you shared because I, I think I still have an priority complex about that being smart in math and science, honestly. I mean, I have to say, you know, and I, because maybe this is the connection in here because, you know, <laughs> until today, I, I say things, uh, honestly, I was like, I don't know if it makes sense to the world or not, you know. I do things, I believe, I do say it, and I don't know. I was like, sometimes I feel very lonely, as a matter of fact, because I feel like, I don't think, what I'm saying resonate. I don't think they're here, like they understand what I'm saying, actually. Maybe, uh, you know, and, and yet you do it, you know, I do it, not because you're trying to, please, you can't, you do it because it's like the air, uh, the air you breathe. You know, people ask me, you know, it's like for me it's not strategic <laughs> at all what what who i am and what i do in the world it is not saying i want to accomplish this and this it's much more like really speaking my truth so when i started women for women and i you know i was 23 years old kid from iraq refugee and not legal refugee but an immigrant from iraq where my country was in war my family was in war i was stranded in america alone with 400 dollars and you know a couple of years later, I said, Women for Women, and everyone's like, What are you trying to accomplish? You tried to, I was like, No, this is like, I have to do this. It's not even getting reward, it's not even getting the, the satisfaction of helping people. It's at all, actually, you don't, I don't get satisfaction of that. It's more like, I need to do it. It's a yes. must. I, yes. it's, you have to walk, you, I, you know. So, but there's always insecurity around it because it is not packaged in the powerpoint to use a, an example <laughs> you know perfection you know it's not packaged right it's more of um, organic uh, very authentic i have to say you know it's just supposed to be right and so it feels I insecure that. i feel insecure in it also mm -hmm. you know so when you say that you felt that i was like oh my god thank god and yeah. i was a b student but then i have to tell you i came back to america when i came to america i went back to studies here and all of a sudden they made me an a i, I was getting an a plus plus in here i was like no but in iraq i was a b minus you know student like you know what are you talking about and i think it is how education or how systems or societies reward creativity and expression as opposed to punish it. And, um, and that punishment, we still have it in all our societies. You know, it, it, the, the impact it has on our authenticity is a big one, I, I think, you know? And so um, all yes. of that, is, thank you for sharing. It makes me feel less alone. <laughs> In the, in, it's, funny, in huh? it's funny to talk about, I mean, just what's coming out, just because we're just having an organic conversation and you, you refer to, I was a B student. And it's really strange because this sense of being graded was 
somehow very deeply ingrained. Yeah. I'm sure, like me, you had reports and they came through. I remember the report card coming through the letterbox and landing on the floor. And I could see the sort of manila envelope with, the, with our address on it. And I knew that's my report. And I was scared of it, you know, because in a way it was going to tell me who I was. Was I A, was I B, was I D, was I D minus? There was shaming in it. And there was kind of like, well, if you had accomplishment, it felt good, you know. But if there were comments and criticisms, which I frequently had about the dreaming and not paying enough attention, or I could be a good student if I, and it was true, I could have been a better student if I focused, but my attention went elsewhere and that was my issue. So I always had that sense of, like you say, A, B, C, and it, it is deeply, deeply ingrained. And it, at the age of 65, honestly, um, and I know you do this too, I wake up and I'm with my grandparents, I'm with my parents, they're flashing through my head. I can see the home where I was brought up. You know, it's, there's a soup that is swirling around as well as everything that ever happened to you. And it's just there and you carry it. And sometimes you think, I'm having a conversation with some nasty teacher that said some nasty stuff and I wanna get back. Maybe what I've done in my life, I was saying this to my daughter yesterday, do you think that maybe all this accomplishment looks like I have all this accomplishment, right? I have a lot of prizes and record, things like that. It's crazy, but I was not that girl. I was not seen as that girl. And maybe I'm making up, but I don't mean to. But it's nobody knows because most of the people in my family, they, 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 my grandparents, my parents, they're gone. So I can't, they don't, they're not seeing what happened in the last 10 years or 15 years, you know, not that it matters, but it's a strange thing from coming from what you mentioned, like B, and I'm immediately like, oh God. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. I mean, I think all of us are living, here's the difference. I think most of us, all of us, uh, live our life in reaction to things that happened before. So when I was a teenager, one day my mother told me you're selfish and stuck with me, right? Really stuck with me. And I spent a lifetime, I'm 50. I spent a lifetime to prove to my mother who has been, who passed away 20 plus years ago that I am not selfish, you know? So I create this huge humanitarian organization. I constantly sacrifice my well being and my safety in um in the way I give, you know, because you can give without sacrificing your well-being. But I the way I did it is sub give it all, like they keep nothing for me. And I think it just occurred to me that I'm still working on this whole issue of my mother telling me you're selfish when I was a teenager. And because whatever, I mean it's a silly example. I, I brought a plate no, of not. watermelon for me and I didn't share it. It was like so the most of us, most of us humans are responding to that upbringing, you know, to whatever story that happened to childhood. And what I realized, and again, I say that as a, as a feminist activist, is when I, there was a difference when I worked on myself and healed my story. There was a time in which I was able to let go of my past, you know, so my trauma was I grew up very close to Saddam Hussein. I called him uncle, not because he was blood relative, because he was my father's friend. And that trauma of being associated with him, mm. where we are not from him, his family, so we were outsiders, but the people saw us as part of him, and we were stuck. You know, my memoir is called Between Two Worlds because that's my life. I was stuck in between two worlds, neither here nor there. That trauma defined me for the longest time, defined my everything I did is in reaction to it, to him, to Saddam, right? 
And it took me a very long time, a lot of work on myself to basically, um, almost if the story is a boat, to push the boat outside, you know, to push it in the water and let it go and have find yeah. my, my own voice, not the reaction to the story that happened to me. And every person has a story in them, right. but in pro action to who am I as a person um, and, and in my core voice. And that for me became the work is, is that voice is who I am rather than reaction to that story. Because that story would haunt us forever until we work on it and, and, and let it go. It's, you see, that's so resonant. I, I really uh, understand the feeling of a character that has been part of your past, that has been so dominant that it kind of, it's kind of in the memory. It's in the memory, no longer there physically anymore, but still so resonant in your life. And I think it's, it's, you're almost obliged to face it down. Um, I don't know, it's, what, what a dilemma it is to be human. Because <laughs> you don't know what your story is going to be. I remember when I was little, it, there was this, there's a song, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, the future's not ours to see, que sera, sera. It used to make me well up when I heard it. You know, it was so poignant. When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? You know, will I be handsome? Will I be rich? And that song, it felt like the future is not our, and it was there. What is the future? Over there on the horizon of the day, the days, the days that go by, you know. And how you can come into a, a different kind of consciousness, the consciousness of the child, the consciousness of the teenager, self-conscious, you know, wanting to have lipstick and hair and go out and be this and that. And then the responsibility of the young adult and what is going to happen in my life and where is it going to end. And the people that came into your narrative, now that I'm older, I look back more than I look forwards because obviously, you know, I'm in the more like the, I'll say the autumn of my days. Um, it's so incredible how certain individuals and certain narratives are still there so strongly and that one almost has to turn around and say, I'm done with this. But if you say, I'm done with this, I, I, you're, you, it's, I, you do it in anger, it doesn't work. It has to be maybe even every day or whenever it pops comes up that it's like in peace, in peace, in peace. Let there be peace. Because I'm at this point now, we're all at this point where we don't know, we don't know what's happening in the whole wide world. We're really at that place and it's hard even to articulate that. It's so because true. it's huge. You know, yeah. and um, where am I going with this? I'm just about, I'll round that thought off by saying that what is very distressing for me in this pandemic, this global pandemic, is that I'm really thinking a lot about people, first of all, who've lost their, uh, their income, their whole way of life. They don't know what the future holds for them. And young people that have, I mean, especially graduates, uh, who've come through university and they've 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 succeeded in that they've achieved what their their goals. Young people that say, "I'm going out now. I'm looking at the horizon. I'm going to go out into the world," and it it concerns me greatly that there maybe isn't the future, the golden future on the horizon. I don't know what it is. I read today in the papers that we've got six months to clear up our response to global warming before we're done. Six months. I read this this morning. Wow. I mean, it's catastrophe everywhere. And I, I don't want to bring the, the conversation to a catastrophic place because you and I, 
fight with this. I know that you fight and I, or we struggle or we, we tr every day we, we're trying to find like, the positive, but it's difficult, isn't it, right now? Well, you know, I'll, I'll go start with Que Sera Sera because it was my mother's favorite song. Oh my God. And she always sang it in our home. And, oh, you yeah. know, I grew up in Iraq, Baghdad, you know, and my mother here singing this English song. Okay. No, I think it's Italian, you know. I think it's it was Italian. I okay, it's so Italian, but I always think it's Italy. I don't know. But so. No, I, I mean, I do I know? Exactly. International. Beautiful. My mother used to say, you yeah. say to me, life is like a roller coaster. Sometimes it's up and sometimes you're down. Make sure you enjoy the whole process. And I think there's a wisdom there that at least it's um, carried on with me. You know, it's like there is no such a thing as life only being good. It just, I, I you know. It doesn't I, exist. It if doesn't anybody exist. has found out, I mean, like, yeah, wow, you are a blessed wow. person. You are lucky, right? Go we'll figure. <laughs> exactly. Can you tell me the secret? You know, it's like an up and down and up and down. And as long as we breathe and enjoy throughout the whole process. And what I mean by enjoy, I used to panic when it's the downtime. You know, like when I go into it, I, I would panic and I would be so harsh on myself. I failed or I did this, whatever it is, so harsh. And recently, as you know, uh, before COVID-19 happened, um, I actually was very, very sick and I was hospitalized and I was in the ICU and I couldn't breathe in the ICU and I almost lost my life, right? And it was not COVID-19. It's a very severe case of Lyme disease I had. And in that, after the months after that, it took me to, you know, I only got better actually very recently. Um, there was more like when people asked me, so what are you going to do now? I was like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I could look at the world and I was like, I don't want to be part of division. You know, a lot of the media is um, with all good intention, um, but it is part of the division right now. It's part of True. fear and division. Yes. And I would like in my ICU hospital, I'm looking at the news, I was like, I don't wanna be part of division. I, I know I don't wanna be that. I wanna be part of bridging and connecting and uniting, but I don't know how, right? And here's, you know, from outside, you may see me as an accomplished person, uh, you know, did this and this, but inside I was feeling, I don't know. I don't like, you know, people say, what are you going to do now? I was like, I don't know. Who are you? I was like, I really don't know. I didn't even know how to describe myself. You know, am I this? Am I this? Am I author? Am I what? I didn't even know. Um, and what I learned though, is to trust in life. Um, and I, and because maybe because I'm alive, that, and that what kept me alive is a trust. It's trust that it, things are gonna, I just have to be the adult in life. And I, I, by the way, this is a personal experience, but it's really for me connected to a political experience. So in that moment of vulnerability for me personally, but I think it applies for the moment of vulnerability in the world right now, one has to show up, you know? So for me, showing up for me was eating healthy, drinking water, doing all the basic things that I have to show up for myself to heal. I think for the world right now is we need to show up. And the only thing not to do these days is not to show up, right? Well, what is showing up means each person has to define it for themselves. Each person has to define it. For, it has to be authentic. It has to be true to yourself, but show up, show up in your life, show up for your community and show up for earth because there is, if not now, then when basically. And so, Yes, it is. We're about to go to, we are in a tumultuous time. I mm. think there will be much more uh, demonstrations and anger. And that anger comes not only because that there is racial injustice, because at the bottom of the, the bottom line of it is that there's an economic injustice and that economic injustice is going to become wider and wider. It's not because there is not going to be money in the world. There is money in the world. It's just the distribution of it is becoming even more separated than ever before we had.
basically, you know? So people who have wealth will have wealth. It's the people who don't have wealth will be larger, basically. So that anger, we're going to see much more. And so how do we show up? Besides, in my opinion, demonstrating and besides speaking, there's we need reforms, we need actions. And that Absolutely. reform some of it yeah. is political, <laughs> but some of it is reform on our personal lives, to be honest. I mean, personally, we need to reform how we purchase, how we behave, how we act, how we do with a... Uh, uh, work with Earth. I mean, one of the things I'm working on is actually is, is a campaign to come up called Daughters of Earth, but it is about personal changes. We need to do changes in our lives, um, not to give up on the policy, do the policy change, the political change, but personal changes. We need to do concrete steps. And one last thing, and I will end. What I, what I learned is when we walk the talk, <laughs> not only demonstrate and shout about when we actually really implement our values, it is very, very hard, very, very hard to implement these values on a concrete way in your heart, in, in your life. But we have to do that. We have to go through the discipline of doing that, which means having less sometimes, you know, which means being odd in conversations because you don't have what people have, you know. Um, but that discipline is an important part of creating the change. We can't just talk about change. Those other people have to do it. We have to do the change in whatever concrete way we know in our own lives, to ourselves, to each other, and to earth, in my opinion. It's so interesting hearing you say this, and I fully endorse what you say. The problem for me, and I know we only have a little bit of time left, which is just, I, I want to carry on and do another conversation. Let's do a whole series. Would yes. Love that. Yes. Nothing more. I would love that. No, just more. carry on. Just carry on. It's so beautiful and really in interesting. And uh, before I forget, what troubles me in this world, as I realized, is that powerful individuals get into places of total power and they can roadblock or bottleneck the changes that need to be desperately imp implemented. You can see it with HIV and AIDS, for example, for me, it was a journey in South Africa where the, you had the biggest instance of a virus that was killing hundreds of thousands of people right under the president's nose. And at the time he said he didn't know anybody who had HIV and he just didn't know anybody. And it was so crazy. And I was, I couldn't believe that this was going on. And I was trying to kind of understand how could this be? Why isn't anyone talking about it? And that women, for me, this was the thing that I saw that women and children were at the front line of this disaster, the ca catastrophe. And nobody was really saying anything. It was like, it didn't even exist. Why? Because this huge stigma around HIV, this still is to this day. And that's one big, big, big pandemic that, we're halfway to solving, but you know, it's, we forgot about HIV and AIDS. But what I'm trying to say is political leaders prevent all the good things and those systems that we need, they, we know they could be changed. Even if it's just incremental change would make a massive difference. They're not invested. When they're not invested in making the change, it doesn't happen. And it's outrageous that this doesn't happen. You know, I'm so angry about that. I mean, it's so true what you're saying, of course. I mean, and I agree with you. And I think we are living in the era of the people. And I would argue we are even living in the era of women, basically. I believe the 21st century has to be the feminine century or yes. else our own existence as humanity is at yes. stake in here, right? Yes. So but it is also the era of the people and that is happening all over the world. I think... Mm you know, where I have hope mm. is to see the people speaking, rebelling, demonstrating, and not accepting or tolerating to be silent. So, so that for me gives, especially young people. That young people, young hope. generation, that's it. They've sort of inherited this. Yeah, it's beautiful to see that. It's, for me, I will beautiful like anything progress. for them. I mean, peaceful, strong, united collaboration, people from all walks of life, every color, 
in, with a united voice saying, no, to, uh, let's end this thing. Let's deal with this sickness that has ravaged people's lives for hundreds of years. Yeah. We're talking about racism here. No, racism and economic and, inequality and yeah, sexism it, the and whole the whole thing. thing right? So that's on the one hand. The danger is um, what someone called, um, the danger is the other side, is the other folks who are not speaking out. And in an economic instabilities, um, and I've seen it so many times in so many different countries, people start trading off their rights and the rights of others in exchange for economic securities and thus allowing the rights of an authoritarian leader. And that's what someone called um, social recession. So on the one hand, you have people speaking up and like that's what gives me hope that it is the era of the people and the people will not be silent until change happens mm -hmm. they, and we have to watch out for the other side of this pendulum of people compromising their rights and knowing that they're looking the other direction at injustice for um for the safety and the stability of their lives and that's for me very very dangerous because when we are silent at injustice in my mm. belief mm. we legitimize it I agree. we legitimize that injustice mm. and we mm. allow for the corruption of our own values because most people are good people i mean most people also think of themselves as good people but if you see something wrong whether it's against a human being or frankly even if it's against an animal and you look at the other direction and you don't speak up then you are corrupting yourself basically that's corruption mm -hmm. it's allowing uh, it's not allowing your value to be implemented authentically and so that's what we have to watch out for is not the compromise but to constantly speak up until change happens so it's a it's a period of i don't know <laughs> it's a tumultuous period and i feel boy this is the time to show up in the world in however way one knows how to show up, but also it's the time to be alive and, and, and help shape um, in whatever ways we know right. uh, the mm -hmm. future, you know? In whatever ways, whatever ways we can, we're just brought in to search for our own resources and where our contribution lies and where you actually stand in all of this. I like as a round off that we've come to this point where you've explained about the clarity, like in a way it's binary. I mean, in terms of racism, I feel you're either racist or you're not racist. It falls on, it's not halfway in the middle. You've kind of got to decide like which, where do, where do I stand? Where, where am I coming from? I think we're all being called to look inside to check our value system. And I know where my value system lies. I know where, yeah, where my heart lies, where I feel I want to build bridges, like you said earlier. I want to find the middle ground, not the extreme, the place where we can be harmonious, where we can listen to each other, and the place of reason, truth, justice, all these things, but coming from a place of an open heart and a willingness to listen to the other. And yeah, to go in partnership, to be, from my perspective, to be an ally. If I can be an ally, if I can help to contribute to transformative change, I try in my own way every day. In a way, these conversations may be part of it because it's just like ins inspiration that might come or just being touched. Like, I honestly go to your, your posts and it's, it's like a sharing and, it's, and it gives me... Um, something to think about that day and like mm, okay that's great i feel good now because i don't have the meditation practice that you've described but even in our conversation now you've given me uh food for thought you know you've given me a perspective and i thank you for that because uh, it's a beautiful thing it's very personal to you like you say the world knows you as an activist as a speaker as an author you show up for all these things then there she is you know ooh, the big glow around you but actually inside there's a person that is has vulnerability for sure but is reaching for your own truth and your own like within the roller coaster of life 
you find the balance and bless you. I, I love you so much. I really love you. I, I love, love you so much. You so much. I have to say every time you, um, you have, I don't know what you got grades in school. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Screw the school part, you know, uh, you have an empathy and you are able to see, see people's soul in ways that, um, deeply touching and it's deeply touching for me personally of course because i feel seen by you mm -hmm. but i also think that you see others as well and i think ultimately what each one of us wants to be is seen you know like our heart seen and when we see each other in that heart connection um uh, walls do get demolished and and a new bridge and bridges get built instead you know isn't it um, Yes. It, I really believe, I feel like that's what perhaps we should, like the lesson you share with, with me, I think with everyone, is that ability to see people's heart just immediately calms the heart and touches the spirit, touches the soul, like, oh, I've seen, I've seen. Yes. And that, like, whoo, then to create a, a, another listening and another hearing, and perhaps we need more of that in this yes. world. And, and the assi I, like the, what I call for everyone who's watching this, how are you seeing the other you know how are you seeing their soul and their heart because in that seeing um there is a, a bridge uh, for a new dialogue and a new relationship true i'm grateful i'm grateful for you for this friendship and for this presence in my life truly right. and in the world for you to be present in the world truly, truly. it goes it goes in a beautiful uh, i don't want to be cliched but truly <laughs> it's a loop it's a loop and it's great i feel so good today now i've spoken to you it's gonna it's given me an internal glow <laughs> to kind of get me through i don't know what's gonna happen today truly Woo! enjoy the whole ride enjoy the whole ride as my mama said <laughs> let's go for it let's do that uh, so i really love you zainab and thank you very much for giving me your time it's just beautiful and i think we have to do this some more <laughs> <laughs> more I would love nothing more would love that thank that you so great, much man. all my love for you all of it thank you love you Zaina. Mm.